Hello, everybody, and welcome to this SimScale webinar. My name is David Short. I am the product manager here at SimScale for structural analysis in particular. And today we are going to be looking at some of the more advanced structural analysis topics um, that, that SimScale really gets into. And that is looking at electric motor design of shaft and rotor interactions. Right. So we're going to be looking at some nonlinear analysis and really seeing um, the benefits of SimScale in those in those use cases. So without further ado, let's get into the agenda for today. For those of you that don't know SimScale, there'll be a quick introduction um, and a little bit more specific detail about the advanced structure analysis, which is really where SimScale thrives um, or SimScale structural thrives. Uh, we will look at a um, specific use case, so a deep dive into a particular electric motor um, and assess the shaft and rotor interaction with, as always, live demonstrations. Um, and after that, please do uh, make sure you have your questions and comments uh, ready to go. You can actually type them in at any point during the webinar. Um, so so just, just write in your questions and we will have time to answer them at the end. We'll also go through next steps of how you can contact SimScale um, and so on. And we should be we should be done with in 45 minutes or so. So what is SimScale? What do we do? SimScale empowers engineers to innovate faster. And how do we do that? We do that by making high fidelity engineering simulation truly accessible. Now we've got the um, we've got the, the image of, of Remax um, electric vehicle here. Uh, one of our one of our um, uh, one of our uh, like proud customers, right? And uh, and we've got a lot of other customers in the in the um, automotive EV space or well, BEV space. Um, a little bit of hydrogen coming through as, as well now, which is which is really exciting to see. Um, but uh, but yeah, so so lots of companies within the the um, electric vehicle market are seeing the benefits of a cloud native simulation tool as it's allowing more access to a wider audience of engineers. So a little bit more specifically about SimScale structure, structural, which is which is my, my domain. Um, what do we do? We make advanced structural analysis truly accessible. So that is simulations that are requiring um, a lot of compute resources potentially long run times, uh, would truly benefit from running simulations in parallel. Um, so those are the kind of simulations that we make truly accessible. Now, how do we do that? We do that because we are, number one, a cloud native, so a truly cloud native solution that is accessed through a web browser. By means that there's no remote desktop, everything is built from within the cloud. You log into SimScale and um, you are setting up your simulations and you're running your simulations all in the same, um, all in the same environment. So everything runs on Amazon Web, ser web Services, the, the simulations and, and the meshing operations, um, and, and that really makes it truly scalable. So that can be in terms of the project itself. So um, how many simulations do I need to run for a given project? You can run as many as the, uh, of them as you like in parallel, but it also allows you to scale up on a model basis as well. So for a small mesh size, we're going to be running that simulation on a small machine. And for a larger mesh uh, that requires maybe more disk storage, disk storage as well um, and um, more time increments, then we'll be running that also on a, on a larger machine. We are one unified platform. So with broad physics, both in terms of structural analysis, so going from linear to nonlinear, dynamic, thermomechanical, all in the same environment, all with the, the same simple um, user experience. Um, and we also uh, have, have what my colleagues are, are, are developing, the um, fluid analysis, electromagnetics, um, so, so physics branching out from the structural domain as well. Uh, but I'm not gonna get into that today. Fourth on my list of my, of my key features, why SimScale or why customers choose SimScale. Um, and it really is the fact that we provide best in class support. Um, so because we're cloud native, it allows us to support essentially all of our customers in parallel. There's no need for data transfer. We can be there to, to provide guidance um, immediately when there is a problem experienced or if you just have a question. So, so the support team, we've invested heavily on the support side of things. So they're there to jump in whenever you have a, have a problem. 
and I recently surveyed my for structural customers and um, that was the number one benefit of, of SimScale, best in class support uh, because we really make sure you get over that learning curve and also help you out if there are any um, any questions or comments along the way. So without further ado, let's get into structural analysis. So we, we want to have a look at the, the capabilities around certain EV components um, and using advanced structural analysis. So firstly, looking at vibration and shock analysis. So this is a key area of interest for essentially all EV customers, batteries, inverters, um, um, chargers, um, electric motors, all of it is, is required to, to pass vibration and shock physical testing. We can virtually simulate those tests using SimScale, using harmonic analysis for vibration, dynamic ana analysis for shock, so that you can really pinpoint peak stresses, um, maximum accelerations, and, and be able to mitigate those, those issues, if you have issues, upfront before you actually get to the prototyping phase. So vibration and shock, that's a key area of interest for our EV customers, as well as what we're going to look at today, and that's non-linear analysis. So actually looking at non-linear uh, interference fitting or shrink fitting, um, plus the, the additional non-linear no loading involved in, for example, um, electric motor simulation, where we're looking at rotors and shaft specifically. So there's a non-linear interaction there, which we're gonna dive into in a lot of detail today. Finally, when it comes to electric motors, it is also critical to not only look at your, your natural stationary vibration modes, but also the rotational influence on, on, on your dynamic response. So we, we do include rotor dynamic uh, capabilities for modal analysis so that you can bring the gyroscopic effects into your simulations and plot Campbell diagrams, identify critical speeds, and, uh, and really bring in the rotational influence onto your um, onto your, your simulations, onto your frequency and, and vibration simulations. Um, that's not only electric motors, that goes for all rotating machines. So today, what we're looking at, the specific use case today, is this specific electric motor with where we're, we're just gonna be looking at the shaft and rotor interaction. So it's, it's a key part of any electric motor design to make sure that we um, correctly size the shrink fit, as well as ensure that our design of the rotor and stator is able to withstand extreme operating conditions. So let's look at what is the load case combination that actually replicates the, the full operating conditions of this electric motor. So you've got a number of steps. You've got an interference fit. Um, typically that's a shrink fit, could be a press fit as well, uh, but today we're going to be looking at a shrink fit. Now for a little bit of understanding about what a shrink fit is, it is essentially using um, heat or heating and cooling to shrink and expand the parts, assemble them together, and then allow them to come back both up to, to the same temperature or find equilibrium at the same temperature and fuse essentially together thanks to the, 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 the contraction and expansion. That was a terrible explanation, um, but luckily I have a video of a good example of a rotor and shaft shrink fit. That's a very different scale to what we're working on today, um, but it it um, makes it a little bit more obvious as well. So let's take a look at this this video. Hopefully you can see it, and hopefully some of you can speak German. Um, so it's going to be a test of your German a little bit. So we have the shaft. That has been cooled down to minus 40 degrees C. Here is the rotor sleeve, which has been heated up to 240 degrees C. So that's expanded, the shaft has shrunk. And then what these guys are going to do fairly bravely is assemble the 240 degree rotor sleeve with the minus 40 degree shaft on a very wobbly ladder. Okay, so you see them inserting the shaft and the, the shaft then slides right in and then when they bring those both back up to room temperature then they will be fused together so a pretty good job and at the end my favorite bit is a big fist pump look at that so hopefully that explains what an interference fit is luckily we don't have to go through all of that um 
all of that effort to 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 simulate it we can use a very um, stress-free modeling approach which is called a fictitious clearance to essentially force a interference between the two parts and see how that affects the stresses um, within the rotor um, the rotor cage and the shaft itself once we have the shrink fit established on the stress state of our rotor and shaft we then need to apply a centrifugal force to replicate the actual spinning of our electric motor we can also add the torque so the maximum torque produced by the electric motor is also going to be felt on the on the shaft and 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 rotor so that needs to be taken into account as well and finally we want to include the thermal expansion of the electric motor in operating conditions so typically these electric motors will be running in fairly hot hot spaces so we'll go from maybe 20 degrees c up to 150 degrees c and we want to see the influence of that thermal expansion on both our nonlinear contact between the rotor and shaft but also on the stresses within the rotor sleeve itself so let's talk a little bit about how we start our simulation um, project in 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 simscale so we first bring in three-dimensional cad so i had the whole um electric motor model here and i split it down so that i've just got the the, the rotor and shaft that's the bit i'm interested in for now I then build my simulation model. So I, I set up all my boundary conditions, I create a mesh, um, and I apply um, some, for example, symmetry conditions where, where that's only actually for, for the first step, where I'm, I'm, we'll get into that in, in a little bit of detail um, further, further along. But what I wanted to show with this image here is, is the, the automated hexahedral meshing. So we do um, automatic sweep meshing, prismatic meshing um, to produce uh, nice quality hexahedral elements um, for these fairly complex geometries. In terms of the physics that we're bringing into our simulation, we're going to bring in nonlinear materials um, because actually, when we do have these large um, shrink fits, it can push the particularly the rotor um, material um, into into plastic deformation, into yielding. So we need to include that in our material model. So I'm using a bilinear elastoplastic material model for both the shaft and the rotor um, and then as we discussed earlier I'm bringing in a combination of all of those uh, load cases that we discussed earlier the interference fit the centrifugal load the torque and the temperature ramping so we'll solve that once it's set up with a nonlinear thermomechanical analysis so that's our analysis type that takes in the, into account essentially all of the structural physics so it's got the thermal it's got the structural um, it's got dynamics um if we need and uh, and and yeah so so that will that will sort us right out for the analysis as always with simscale it's going to be cloud driven um so this isn't running on your local hardware this will be solved in the cloud so you can do that from a laptop you can do that from anywhere um and uh, and and um we can even run multiple of these simulations in parallel and i'll do a demonstration of that in just a moment so Let me bring SimScale into the picture. So here is SimScale. You can see that it is purely contained in a web browser. That means it can be accessed from anywhere at any time. And because it's running on, on remote machines, it can be accessed at any scale. So based on the, on the, on the mesh size or the model size. So here is my full case where I'm solving all four steps together. Um, I'm not, I'm not going to run through the whole the whole setup because I think it's a bit boring for everybody. Um, so I'll just run through run through the main main points where I've actually added the, uh, the 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 different load cases. So I'm using, as I mentioned earlier, a thermomechanical simulation. So you start a thermomechanical simulation from the simulation library, create a simulation, gives you a rough template, and then you add on on top of that to, to replicate your, your, your real world operating conditions. So if we go from the top, we've got a physical contact. So that's a non-linear contact between the shaft and rotor itself. I've got friction included in the, in the contact. And the trick to bring the shrink fit into our analysis is to actually include something called a fictitious clearance. So you'll see that the model 
there is actually no penetration um, and uh, there's no gap. So what we can do, rather than modeling the, 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 the interference in the CAD model, we can do it purely with the contact. So we add a fictitious, a fictitious clearance of, so here's 60 microns. Um, and you'll see I've got, I'm, I'm doing some time stepping here. So I'm going from time zero to time four, because I have four load cases that I want to combine in my simulation. And the first step going from zero, time zero to time one, is the introduction of the interference fit distance itself. So we ramp it up from zero up to 60 microns. And then we leave it at 60 microns for the rest of the simulation. Let's get to materials. So as I said, I'm using a bilinear elastoplastic material model where you define the yield stress, you, divide, you, you define the ultimate point um, as, a, as a fairly um, simple, um, simple way of defining a nonlinear material. Okay, um, so often you'll get a you'll get all of this information from from a basic material data sheet, and you might not even need the full stress strain curve. So I quite like using this approach, um, particularly in the in in at the design at the design phase, uh, if if we don't have full um, stress strain data available for us. So I'm using a bilinear elastoplastic material model, both for the shaft and for the rotor sleeve as well. Now we've got lots of we've got constraints in the model to 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 make sure it's not flying away uh, flying away in space, but also not providing too much constraint or over constraining the problem such that it can't deform realistically. So I'm using what we call um, a remote displacement, which uses deformable spider elements to essentially um, allow the body to be constrained, but also um, deform during the simulation. I've applied a centrifugal force on the entire model. So just like I did for the for the shrink fit, I've done the same here for the centrifugal force. So from step one to step two, I'm ramping from centrifugal force or a rotational velocity of zero up to 20,000 RPM, so 2,904 radians per second. Okay, so the, the, the second step is ramping up that rotational velocity which applies a centrifugal force. The third step, exactly the same, I apply a moment going from zero to 90 uh, newton meters of, of torque. So that's the max torque produced by this electric motor. And finally, I do a temperature ramp from 20 degrees C up to 150. Okay, there we go. So that's the full setup. Um, there are some additional boundary conditions, additional settings that we don't need to get into right now um, as we don't have time, but that, that gives you the, the, the general overview of how we set a problem up like this. Now, critical in these kind of simulations is, um, is a, a mesh setup. So what I've done here is something called automatic sweep meshing. So automatic sweep meshing finds bodies that are able to produce hexahedral elements or um, or swept elements prismatic elements um, which are which are always superior to to your standard tetrahedral elements um, so i've used automatic sweep meshing here to create um, this this very nice mesh um, which is then ready to simulate okay so we won't look at the full run just yet because I want to actually dig into step one, the interference fit sizing in a little bit more detail. So the first simulation I actually did was just step one. And I did that with a small model, okay? The, because I wanted to first understand how much influence does a certain shrink fit have on the stresses and, and the, the deformations um, within the model and the contact pressures as well, that's critical. So I've again set up a fictitious clearance for step one. Um, and I've actually run multiple simulations here in parallel with different 
um, fictitious clearances. So you can see under my simulation runs, I've run one at 40 microns, one at 50, one at 60, one at 70. Um, so let me just set, set off a few more as well. So one at 80. So we start the simulation here, 80 microns. So that heads off into the cloud. Let's do another one at 90. And we could do another one, maybe pushing it up to 100 because so then we've got our got three simulations running in parallel there. So they'll take about 30 minutes or so to, to solve. Um, the mesh size, I've actually gone pretty, gone pretty fine here, um, with, with this kind of mesh here to do my, to do my initial assessment, uh, which is up for sort of 90,000 nodes or so. Um, so running that for at least sort of 10, 10 or so load increments, um, to, to, to ramp up the, the shrink fit, um, takes about, takes about half an hour. Um, and you can run as many simulations as you like in parallel. So let's have a look at, um, for example, how you get results out of Sim, out of SimScale. So you head into the the solution fields and let it load up for a second. Okay, and there's my solution. What I've done is I've capped the I've capped the top of my von Mises stress at the yield point. Um, we can use the, the full range. Uh, so at about, I think the, the ultimate stress is at 430 megapascals, but so we can we can understand what is the real risk to the, the rotor sleeve. And the rotor sleeve is where we have the majority of the stress, not in the, not in the shaft, uh, the rotor cage, sorry. And, uh, and then we can actually animate this to see how that interference actually progresses from, from, from zero up to 70 microns. Uh, let's slow that down a little bit. Okay, and then you can see um, how the stress develops within the, 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 rotor, um, the rotor cage as the as the, the interference fit is solved now this is equivalent to looking at the stresses within that massive rotor and shaft that we saw in the video okay so as those temperatures are coming back to room temperature you would see this development of stress within the within the cross section so it's a really nice way of of simply simulating that quite complex um, uh, procedure that, that takes a takes a bit of manual effort to do physically. Um, let's actually see what it's doing. So you can actually see if you zoom in. I hope you can all see that at home. You can actually see that it's creating the gap up to seventy microns. Okay, and that's how we introduce the shrink fit into our problem. Now I'm going to quickly go back to the slides. So we can look at a comparison um, of of all of those um, of the ones that I ran in parallel. So step one in detail, we had a look at going from 40 to 70 microns. Um, we were able to look at what is the minimum contact pressures, the maximum contact pressures, um, as well as seeing where is the stress developed within within the rotor cage, um, as we just saw on the platform as well. So as you saw, I used a three millimeter section just to do this initial assessment. Um, and I ran all of those simulations in parallel. So my main takeaways from this was that we don't see stresses in any of the shrink fit um, sizes going above 70% of the ultimate strength of the material. Um, and interestingly, the, the amount of yielding or the sort of yielding region isn't hugely in, influenced by the increasing 
interference distance. You actually see that even for a 40 micron interference up here, you have a, a, a quite a similar region of yielding as you do for the for the 70 um, for the 70 megapascal. Um, obviously, you have some higher stress concentrations um, around the around the fillets in the in the 70 microns, but the sort of overall yield the overall yielding pattern isn't isn't huge, drastically different between 40 to 70 microns. Now, what I found quite interesting, and it, and it makes sense when you think about it, is the contact pressure distribution. Um, there's actually a much more even spread of contact pressure distribution for a lower um, interference distance, right? Because you essentially have some very stiff bits of the rotor um, where you don't have these, these gaps, um, and they are, are um, expanding less than, than, than the more flexible bits in the middle. So what happens is you get this sort of patterned contact pressure on the, on the, um, on the, on the rotor surface. And actually that pattern is exaggerated for the higher interferences. So that's an interesting, that's an interesting, um, takeaway from this. I wasn't really expecting that, but actually when you think about it, I guess it does make sense. So let's look at um, also the full steps one to four. So here, we do exactly the same simulation, um, but with all four steps. Um, but here, when we want really true true results, we need to model the entire the entire model, okay? And uh, I've done that using a um, using a number of different meshes, and up to about yeah about two hundred thousand nodes or so um, for, for for running that that full case. Now that takes a little bit longer. Um, we've got to run all four load cases um, and. That one takes around 715 minutes or so, okay, to to run the the full case, okay. And we've already had a look at some of the results from there as well, um, but I put them together in the slides. So we can see step one, just like how we saw in the in the symmetry model, um, we we are seeing pretty much the same the same behavior using the using the shrink fit. We then apply the 200,000 RPM uh, centrifugal force or rotating speed, which, which influences the, the centrifugal force. We apply a max torque and then we see the stress state um, slightly rotating within, the, um, uh, within both the shaft and the rotor. And then really interestingly is the thermal loading. Um, so the thermal loading has a massive influence on the stress state. We see a, a, relie a relieving of the stress around the actual contact and, uh, and more buildup of stress in the, in the exterior of the rotor. Um, so this was also quite interesting. And for further work, um, I think it certainly makes sense to do the full parallelization. So looking at different shrink fits, uh, including all four steps as well, because as that expansion happens between the, the of the of the rotor, um, which has a different thermal expansion coefficient as the shaft, as that expands more, um, the influence on the contact pressure is going to be more um, more greatly felt. So so actually, we need to look at contact pressure or the influence of the, the thermal load on the contact pressure as well, because at high temperatures we might actually have cases where the the, the contact compression is potentially lost in some cases, or or goes underneath an acceptable range, or above an acceptable range, however you want to word it. Um, so yeah, so those are the all four steps in parallel, and then sorry, in in combined sequentially. And the final state here, I wanted to dig into um, a couple more results result fields that you can output from from SimScale, and that's number one. Where do we have permanent plastic strain? And that's in these, um, highlighted in, in, in pink and, um, and orange areas. And what is the final stress state after the thermal load as well? Where do we have yielding uh, within, within the model? So hopefully that gives you an idea of what you can get out of a multi-stage thermomechanical simulation in SimScale. 
I've got to put my hands up. I'm not an electric motor designer, so I'm sure many of you are going to tell me that was um, a load of rubbish in terms of the insights that I'm getting out of. But what I want to show is what you can do with the platform, right? And then I want to hear from you as to how would these results here influence your design decisions. So that's really the, the key benefit of, of simulation, taking those results and working out what do we do um, to, to mitigate the, the high stress areas, or do you say these stress areas are fine, right? Uh, so that's, that's the bit of knowledge that I don't have uh, within the electric motor field. So that's where I'd love to start a conversation. Um, and, uh, and, uh, and yeah, so, so please do um, make sure you get in touch. And, and if you have any questions now, once we've done a quick summary, uh, then, then I will be able to get to them. So we've got the, um, we've had a look at the small cross section with a parametric design study where we've incrementally, uh, or we run multiple shrink fits in parallel to understand the influence of the shrink fits on the stresses as well as the contact pressures. And then we've gone into full model multi-stage thermomechanical analysis where we've sequentially combined all of the operational loads to give us deep insights into the stress and contact states felt by the rotor and shaft throughout its operating life cycle. Okay, so that gives us confidence going to the prototyping phase and it has identified potential risk areas that may need redesign. Now, as I said, for further work, I think it makes sense to look at the multiple shrink fits for the entire model. So to take into account the thermal loading and the expansion on those, um, on that, on the contact pressures as well as the the peak stresses felt okay so thank you so much if you have any questions then then please do do fire away um, and i will keep my eye on the chat to to see if we've got any questions coming in perfect and if you do um want to get in touch you can contact me directly uh, my email address is there you can request a demo with um, by visiting the website or contacting the sales team directly, and we'll have an application engineer get straight in touch with you. Um, and uh, and yeah, so any any questions, any um, any comments, then then direct them over to me, and I'd love to to start a conversation around this around this topic. So we've got one um, question that's come in: Can we modify? the base solvers in SimScale to include custom physics. So we try to produce full solutions for particular physics. So you don't have customization on the solver level itself. But what I would advise is if there are specific physics that you're interested in, take a look at SimScale um, for um, at the different solutions that we offer. Because it's not only structural analysis, we have electromagnetics, we have fluid dynamics, um, we have therm pure thermal analysis, um, combinations between CFD and, and thermal analysis. So there's a lot of different physics solvers that we that we use, but you don't have full access to customize the, the physics like you might do with console or, or, or one of those more um, customized tools. What we want to do is provide a simple to use um, experience that that, that solves um, key key physical problems. So, if there are no further questions, then all it is is to leave me to say thank you very much for for attending. Um, I hope that was interesting. Um, I know I learned a lot researching and, and talking to our customers doing electric motor um, assessment, um, and it's and it's been a, a very fun project. So so so, so yeah, thank you for watching. And uh, if you do have any questions, then feel free to reach out. Thank you so much, and have a great day.